Hello. Um, I'm Elliot, and today we'll be talking about the screens of pathologies in Pyrus pulgaris as a baseline for leprosy studies. So, leprosy is caused by two mycobacterial agents, M. leprae and M. leprematosus. Both of these have been identified in red squirrel populations in the UK. This is interesting because the strain of M. leprae that was found have been circulating in humans since the 6th century CE in England before going extinct in the 16th century. And it has also been found in archaeological squirrel bones from the 12th century Winchester sites. This means that squirrels were infected with not just M. leprae, but this specific strain since the medieval period. My PhD project, therefore, has been focusing on tracing this infection in squirrels in the archaeological record. The primary research question has been, can evidence of M. leprae or M. lepromatosis infection be found in squirrel skeletons? But in order to investigate that, another more pressing question arose pretty quickly. How do we know if a lesion is associated with leprosy? This is because up until now, there has been no clinical baseline with which to compare skeletons of infected squirrels against. Um, and it's difficult to look at these infected squirrel skeletons because M. leprae is a category three biological hazard. And it's, you know, a little difficult uh, <laughs> to get access to these and then deflush them because they still, they still juicy. Um, which leads me to my next question and the focus of today's presentation. How do we characterize the pathologies of the squirrel skeleton so that we can build that clinical baseline? So, leprosy. In humans, it manifests along a spectrum of symptoms depending on the host immune response. Untreated multibaxillary leprosy can be seen in the human skeleton with a suite of pathognomonic lesions. This includes the whittling and or resorption of the digits as in image one, uh, the subperiosteal reaction on the long bone, such as in image two, which is on the distal tibia. And it can also be seen in the resorption of the anterior nasal spine and the rounding of the nasal aperture and the uh, resorption of the alveolus in the front of the maxilla. Hi. Oh, yeah. In, no, 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 that's, in that's this absolutely publications fine. of really, leprae and really, uh, uh, infection in red squirrels, they found that the symptomatic cases, because not all positive cases were symptomatic, presented similar soft tissue lesions as we see in humans. This includes the cutaneous swellings on the ears and on the snout, as well as alopecia or hair loss, and ulceration on the hind limbs. So, now that we know what the soft tissue lesions look like, what about the squirrel? What does the squirrel skeleton look like? Where should we be looking? Because the question more often than not has been, does this animal have leprosy? It doesn't ask, what does a systemic infection look like in this animal? And how can we build a diagnosis? So in order to do that, we need to build that baseline, understanding what common pathologies manifest in this animal, and then compare possibly infected material to the clinical studies. So then we can identify the appearance and distribution of leprosy specific lesions, hopefully. So with the red squirrel skeleton, what we'll be looking at Primarily, it's going to be the lower limbs, the feet, and the right on maxillary area, or the skull. So this has been from uh, this is an image from Historic England uh, reference collection in Portsmouth, and the skull and mandibles from the University of Oxford. Um, so get an idea of what the skull skeleton looks like. We'll be returning more to specific cinema. So in order to develop this baseline of the common pathologies in a squirrel skeleton, I undertook macroscopic analysis of 37 skeletons held in reference collections by the following institutions, and analyzed the cataloged records held by the National Museum Scotland that were collected by Dr. Andre Romani. I separated these into two data sets, one being the quote unquote other collections, which I personally undertook analysis on, and the other being the data records, so that we can see if there is a significant difference between a small and a large sample size. Uh, we should also be noted that since the NMS collection was analyzed by someone other than myself, I looked at a few, but not all 600 plus, 
uh, there might be some inconsistencies in the recordings and our descriptions of lesions. So I'm hoping to revisit the data and look at the skeletons themselves again as they double check our work. When looking at the frequency of certain lesion types, there are two ways to sort the data out by the lesion types themselves and by where these lesions appear in the skeleton. When looking at the former, we get a chart that looks like this. Anyway, I have given you guys my previous. So I have pictures of what these all look like, but apparently that is in a different slide. So I'm just going to run through this real quick instead. In the other collections, lesions associated with trauma tended to predominate. This meant that if you have a fracture and it's healed pretty well, or if it's malhealed and you see that the bone has not quite aligned right, um, we see that in the trauma section. That is then followed by the bone destruction and arthropathy. So arthropathy is arthritis related changes, so age related changes, where the bone can get and the joints can get worn down. Um, or in some cases, you have uh, bone formation and remodeling. So you have the bone trying to adapt to increased stress. This can also be, again, age related. Sometimes the bone formation and bone destructions were not quite specific enough to be arthropathy, but potentially could be. It's a little difficult to tell. In comparison at the National Museum Scotland collection, the remodeling and general bone formation was the much more common, um, common lesion. We also see something Dr. Ramaniov describes as puffiness. This appears to be associated with a few different conditions. Uh, including more specific infections where it's linked with porosity. But it also might be something that is age related, which could be explained by just you know, different stages of when these animals were dying and then we prepared the skeletons and that's what we see. So let's take a look at where these are happening within the skeleton so that we can get a better picture of what to expect in particular parts of the body. Where we have more bones, such as the thorax, we're going to be seeing more lesions associated with trauma because there are more bones that will be affected. If, you, if a little squirrel gets hit by a car, there's going to be a lot of ribs that are going to be involved in that um, compared to the forelimbs or hind limbs where there's only three or four testes. So this explains the high, uh, higher spike in the thorax category for trauma. I also put the vertebra in a separate category, even though those could be in the thorax, but that's another question. Um, what is interesting here is the relative consistency of lesion types in the limbs and the higher frequency of trauma in the podios. Uh, this makes sense when you consider how squirrels use their paws and their arboreal existence, so mainly in trees, running about. When we look at the National Museum Scotland collection, however, a slightly different picture starts to emerge. This may be due to the larger sample size, which is interesting. Um, trauma becomes less dominant across the skeleton and replaced instead by the remodeling in the podials, antisopathies, uh, which are the bony re reaction to consistent trauma, um, including like you know, when you pull a muscle or pull a tendon or if you're using a certain uh, tendon more often than not, that's what happens. Um, and what we also see again is this puffiness and porosity, particularly in the limbs. There's something going on with the skull, but I'll come back to that in a second. How does this help leprosy studies? What is the point of all this? The analysis of the frequency of different lesion types in general and where they occur across the skeleton helps to build a baseline for differential diagnosis and helps us with questions such as what could a lesion be associated with? Where are certain lesions found in the body? Based on my analysis, there are a couple areas where differential diagnoses needs to be kept in mind when looking at skeletal material as part of leprosy studies. And this includes the lower limbs where age and activity related changes predominantly occur uh, in the mandibles and in the bones of the paws. I'm going to run through these relatively quickly. So as I was saying earlier about the puffiness and porosity, what we see here are a couple different examples that Dr. Andrew Emanuel pointed out to me. Uh, some of these might, again, be age-related, 
long bones um, at, when you're a juvenile uh, aren't fused completely. So we see this porosity um, resulting from vascularization of the bones because it got about to fuse. That makes sense. Then you have pictures like one and four where there's potentially some other infection or trauma happening. Uh, that is not normal. That's not what it should look like. Um, and then we also have bones where there isn't this age-related fusion happening um, or has already occurred, and we still see this porosity as in uh, image five with the edge of the scapula. Then we have the mandibles. In humans, changes in the nasal aperture and in the alveolus, maxillary incisors, and specifically um, are what we see in leprosy cases. Squirrels, however, cannot survive for long without their incisors, and I didn't find any cases where there was evidence of incisor loss. Instead, we found something more interesting, in my opinion, which is this higher incidence of infection, specifically osteomyelitis, which is infection of the bone, uh, more often in the left mandible than in the right mandible, to the point where it was actually statistically significant, according to a chi-square test. I'm still trying to figure out why this might be the case, because in some cases it's trauma, as in image four. Um, but in other cases, as in images two and one, it's a little less clear. Um, this might be related to the dentition and may indicate a side preference when chewing, um, but something to think about. While leprosy tends to affect the rhinomaxillary area in humans, what if it affects the mandible more in squirrels? Finally, we have the metapodials in the phalanges. In humans, these are some of the key areas for identification of leprosy archaeologically. Uh, with squirrels, it is important to remember that these are animals that often suffer traumas to the metapodials, as seen in these images where we have um, this images of fractures. I'll call them comminuted fractures, but it, we can think of them as swishing fractures to get a finger caught. Um, and what might happen here is that these traumas may obscure any disease processes that we would see from leprosy. Conclusion, uh, there, I hope this presentation highlights the need, I was waiting for people to catch on to that one. Um, there are some <laughs> highlights the need for developing differential diagnoses when analyzing understudied species. We need to keep in mind that humans are not squirrels. And as a result, the lesions pathognomonic of M. leprae infection in humans may not occur the same way or at all in squirrels with the same infection. Uh, the next step will be uh, reviewing the NMS data to better narrow down the characteristic pathologies and to then compare that baseline developed with the infected squirrels once, um, once I'm allowed to uh, handle some category three level infected squirrels. We'll see. We'll see about that one. And that's it, y'all. Thank you. All right, putting that close to time. Yeah, plan to try to figure out why the left side was worse than the right side? Like, are you going to grow eating habits or? Well, well actually, it's going to um, Please don't bring me any gray squirrels. They are not red squirrels. It's not a thing. Um, but potentially, there is a there has been a study done on uh, skull morphology in red squirrels that that's not weird at all. Um, the squirrels have been fed peanuts by visitors to parks and um, national air, like protected areas, um, and how that might actually be damaging um, squirrel dentition because of their, it's too soft for their little teeth. So they can't grind down, and so then there's over, overgrowth. So I'm looking into that, but otherwise there haven't been any other studies. I'm excited to look into it, but who knows. Any other questions? Anything online? Yeah, 